coming on to mute your mute your screens. We appreciate it. Um, I'm going to say good evening and hello. It's to to everyone who's here. My name is Nancy Marks Erickson, and I'll be your moderator tonight, uh, along with uh, my team of Sharon Kern McCall and Laura Richardson. And we also have Paula, um, <laughs> Paula, the, the TMA executive director here that will be helping us. Um, also, I think Rachel Bromley is on, TMA Senior Director of Education and Policy. So um, thank you all for coming tonight. And as we have, we, we are so excited to be able to have this incredible speaker um, who is joining us tonight. So PMA, along with the women with IBM, are excited to talk, present, amplifying the voice of myositis patients at the FDA. The Myositis Association mission, to those of you who don't know, is to improve persons affected by myositis, fund innovative research, and increase myositis awareness and advocacy. The women with IBM mission is to improve the lives of women affected by inclusion body myositis through virtual connections and support that transcend geography. Tonight's agenda is a welcome and guidelines for our meetings, introduction of our speaker uh, on FDA, her, her presentation on FDA research, our summary, and looking ahead to additional meetings and programs that are gonna be happening over the next several months. With that, our session goals for the Myositis Association and the Women with IBM is to build and create a sense of community amongst individuals with myositis, to network and collaborate, to obtain information from professionals in the field, to find joy and hope along our journey, and to create a self and welcoming environment. So a little bit of Zoom etiquette for those of you. Um, just a reminder, thank you for being on time. And please remain muted. Um, and because of the large turnout this evening, um, any, the presenters will respond to questions received if time uh, if there is time through the chat. Um, all of the other questions that we received in advance have been submitted to her, and she will try to address as time permits. So we want to say thank you for all of that. So our session overview, as patients and caregivers, with various forms of myositis, how do we make our voices heard? How does the FDA, how the FDA funds research for rare diseases like myositis? How can we be advocates at the FDA and Congress to advance research to find a cure for myositis? How patient advocacy can help advance myositis research within government agencies. We, tonight is an incredibly special honor to have someone at this level speaking um, about myositis. We are excited to have Julie C. 
hearing JD. Julie is the Deputy Center Director for Strategy, Policy, and Legislation at the Center for Biologics, Evaluation, and Research, CEDAR, with the Food and Drug Administration. And I'm going to read briefly <laughs> Julie's bio she sent me. Um, and then she's going to go into a little bit more personal aspect of why she's involved and how she's involved and, and so interested in these, this subject. Julie Tierney is a Deputy Director for Strategy, Policy, and Legislation for the Food and Drug Administration Center for Biologics, Evaluation, and Research, CBER. In this role, Ms. Tierney oversees CBER's policy and product jurisdiction work, leads the center's legislative engagements, and drives strategic changes the center's need in, to the center's needs as it grows. Ms. Tierney has served in multiple roles during her tenure with FDA, most recently between January 2021 and December of 2023. She served as Chief of Staff of the agency, overseeing the daily management of the agency and leading agency activities on major initiatives. Uh, immediately prior to that, Ms. Tierney was Chief of Staff for CBER, serving as a Principal Advisor to CBER Director Peter Marks and working closely with him to manage CBER's response in the first year of the COVID-19 pandemic. From 2015 to 2016, Ms. Tierney was FDA's detailee to the U.S. Senate Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee as a senior health policy advisor, where she played a critical role in negotiations of the 21st Century Cures Act. She joined the FDA in 2008 as an associate to counsel for drugs in FDA's Office of, Office of Chief Counsel. Prior to working at the FDA, Ms. Tierney practiced food and drug law at private law firms. She received her JD from Georgetown University Law School and her undergraduate degree in biology and history from Johns Hopkins University. Um, with that, I am going to turn it over to Ms. Tierney and um, Paula Eichenbrenner to for her remark. And we are honored again as part of Myositis Awareness Month to be able to have Julie talk about myositis research and the FDA. Thank you. Uh, Nancy, thank you so much for such a warm welcome. I'm really happy to be here. It's, it's, this is giving me like 2020 vibes when we all used to um, get online and have our virtual happy hours. Um, because <laughs> that was our only human contact, but I've really appreciated how Zoom has allowed us to stay connected um, with folks across the country, um, even after, uh, you know, most folks have resumed sort of normal, normal operations. Um, before I get into my, my presentation and, um, you know, I want to talk a little bit, I, I want to talk tonight about, um, about FDA um, about CBER, the center that I work in, our patient engagement work, um, some of the rare disease funding that, that's available at FDA, although it's certainly not that much compared to other agencies, um, and, and how we are working to incorporate the patient voice into, um, into clinical development of therapies, particularly for rare diseases, um, and where I think patients uh, can, can really play a, a critical role critical role and it's not just um 
you know, it's not just at the very beginning and it's not just at the the very end. It's it's all along the way. So um, hope I'm hope, hopeful that I'll give you some ideas. Um, one of the questions I saw that came in um, before there were a lot of really good questions, but like, how can I be most effective? How can I how can I be effective? And I'm hoping that I'm going to give you some resources tonight uh, that that can help you um, amplify your voice and um, move forward research. As I really like to see uh, safe and effective therapies available for for all all folks with rare diseases. Uh, there are so many of them. Uh, I want to really make sure that we're operating in a science based manner to to get folks treatment that they need. Um, I just wanted to start before I dive in just to talk a little bit about myself. Um, Nancy read my bio. Thank you. It's a little embarrassing to hear out loud. But um, in addition to that, I would just say um, I am a I, I am a, a dedicated public servant. Um, I felt the call of, of government work. My mother also is a federal employee. And uh, after I paid my law school loans off, uh, I turned to my husband and said, FDA's chief counsel's office is hiring. Um, I want to go work at FDA. And he said, what about all that extra money we're going to have from your student loans being paid off? And I said, well, I'm going to be serving the public. And um, he will tell he will tell everyone I work much more than I ever did in private practice since I've been at FDA. Um, in addition to being a dedicated public servant, I am a middle-aged woman who, you know, sometimes panics when I feel a cringe in my body. Um, I am a caretaker. I am a daughter. I am a mother. I'm a wife. Um, I've been a caretaker to my mother uh, through through cancer treatments. Um, you know, I am balancing children and home and work, demanding career. Uh, my it, uh, I grew up in a household of all women, uh, so I definitely um, am uh, feel like maybe a little a little biased to understand uh, women's issues. And know sometimes they're not understood by by men. Um, one of one of the things that my family has been dealing with over the the past few years uh, is that we were in a car accident a few years ago, and my husband's been recovering from a traumatic brain injury uh, for about two and a half years, which um, he can function, uh, but certainly it's it's definitely affected his executive functioning and his ability to drive at night um, and things like that. And so we as a family have had to sort of recalibrate how we do things, but the um, journey through the different specialists and um, occupational therapy and other things has been very eye-opening to me um, because it's not a, it's not a short journey. Um, it's one that one that continues um, and that I expect to continue. So, um, but with that in mind, I really felt it was important. I was delighted to to join you all tonight uh, to, to take some time to, to talk to you and um, talk to you a little bit about about FDA. I, I think sometimes it's like a, I don't know, a black black curtain or something. Um, and and what we do, what we don't do, and how how hopefully we can we can help you all. So um, if you want to go to the next slide, Paula. So our mission at FDA is to protect the public health by ensuring the safety, efficacy, and security of human and veterinary drugs, biological products, and medical devices, as well ensure, as ensuring the safety of our nation's food supply, cosmetics, and products that emit radiation. So FDA actually regulates televisions, um, which is sort of weird because uh, they're not medical devices. Um, but a uh, whole whole range, a quarter of the nation's economy is uh, is regulated by FDA on any given day. And so we are a mission driven organization and I feel very, very committed to all of these parts of our mission. In particular, I've spent a lot of time working on medical products, drugs and biologics um, and working to facilitate the development of, of safe and effective therapies. Um, I have spent a good amount of time during my career at FDA and on the Hill working on rare disease issues. So I feel like I've got a bit of a passion on that. Uh, next slide. Great. Um, so the way that uh, FDA is organized is a little bit uh, maybe different. Some folks are familiar with the way NIH is organized where it's uh, the institutes are regulated or are, are sort of organized by uh, different types of diseases, you know, so you've got the National Institute of, of Aging, you've got the, the National Institute of uh, Neurological Diseases and Strokes, uh, I think that's right, um, you know, the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. At FDA, our centers are are divided up in the types of products that, that we regulate, so we've um, got the Center for Devices and Radiological Health Devices, those are, you know, knee implants, toothbrushes, 
um, pacemakers, sort of the mechanical things uh, that that uh, in vitro diagnostics actually uh, that that are medical products. The Center for Drugs um, are are therapies. Uh, probably what pe most people think of as their, their medicines, um, uh, over the counter drugs, uh, statins, antibiotics. Um, what we think of as small molecule, so chemical chemical drugs. And then um, the Center for Biologics, where I work, uh, is a very unique center. Um, I think it's great. I get to collaborate with my colleagues across the agency. If you move to the next slide, um, some examples of the products that, that we regulate. It's basically, um, well, this, I'm sorry, this is our, our mission, right? So the safety, purity, potency, and effectiveness of biological products. So those are vaccines, allergenics, blood and blood products, cells, tissues, and gene therapies that are used in the prevention diagnosis diagnosis or treatment of human diseases, conditions, or injury. So I like to think if it's like alive uh, in some way or looks like something that's alive, it's probably regulated by, by CBER. Um, next slide, please. So, um, and I, I feel like we've got really excited products in our center. So we've got we've got gene therapies. We are on the cusp of, I think, a revolution um, in, in gene therapies for, for illnesses that that we know have genetic causes. Unfortunately, I think that can be very frustrating for patients where the pathophysiology of a disease is not as not as defined. Um, you know, we've got human tissues and cellular products. So those are like tissue graphs, um, you know, amniotic amniotic fluid, which is used in the wound management. Um, folks market stem cells for all sorts of uses, but um, you know, uh, CAR-T products are cellular products as well that have been modified. The xenotransplantation products, that's um, where we modify animal products to look more like human. So you all may have seen recently, there was a, uh, a man who received a heart transplant um, that was a, a pig heart actually that had been genetically modified so that it had human characteristics and wouldn't be rejected. So um, that's that's a really exciting area, especially for folks that are on transplant wait list. Wait list. Um, I, I won't go through the whole list, but just to say, of course, vaccines, I'm sure well, are very familiar uh, with our work. Maybe you didn't realize it was our work during um, during the pandemic um, with the COVID-19 mRNA vaccines. Uh, Peter Marks was the brain trust behind Operation Warp Speed and getting those those vaccines out in record time. And I was uh, very honored to work closely with him um, during that time. So, um, you know, we've got blood plasma, blood products, um, immunoglobulins are regulated by our center. So, so a really diverse set of products, um, but really, I think some exciting potential with them. All right, so, uh, so, so at CBER, we've got patient engagement sort of through, throughout our center. I sit within the office of the center director. We have a designated patient engagement team, um, a designated rare disease team who, who uh, and I'll get back to that in a second. Um, at, you know, in our, we've got various offices, uh, the Office of Biostatistics, they've got some, they work on statistical methodology around patient preference studies. Um, our Office of Communications is a great portal They've got the CBER patient engagement mailbox that sort of a one-stop shop. Our Office of Therapeutic Products regulates gene therapies and cellular products. And I'll talk a little bit later in my presentation about the Regen Med Ed program, which I think is um, probably a great resource. And then all of our um, therapeutic, all of our offices, product offices, Office of Therapeutic Products, as well as our Office of Vaccines um, has targeted staff that, that work on, on patient engagement and patient preference and incorporating that into the review of products. Um, next slide. And this is just, uh, I, I think, um, Paula, you're gonna send around slides afterwards, but these are just links to, to our um, rare disease program website, as well as our patient engagement program. And I, I guess before I, before I move forward, um, I wanna say our rare disease program within the center um, is, a, is a small team that helps to sort of coordinate and make sure that we're socializing across the center, different approaches to rare disease product review and development. Um, I really think of our center as a rare disease center, to be completely honest. Uh, I think about 70% of our products that we approved in the past few years had orphan designation. There's a good number of them that don't have orphan designation that were still for rare diseases. Just, for various historical reasons, 
we're not designated. So, you know, when I think about our rare disease program, I really think about our whole center because it it um, uh, it really encompasses encompasses all our work. Um, and I guess because it's seven o'clock, I'm a little scattered after a long day. I I, I did want to take a step back, and the reason I'm sort of diving into our patient engagement programs is because, with rare exception, and I'll talk about that in a little bit later later in my presentation, FDA doesn't fund research. And so our role, uh, I think, in patient involvement in research and in research is that we oversee the clinical trials as part of the product development program. So anytime there's a, a trial of a uh, of an unapproved product or um, an unapproved use of a, an approved product, that will have to be, that protocol is reviewed by FDA and we provide um, advice to sponsors um, on, you know, first of all, whether or not their, their trial protects the safety of, of the participants, but also whether or not the design will ultimately support approval of their product. So we are meeting with sponsors very, very early in development um, before they ever start their clinical trials. Then they submit their protocol to us. We're allowing them to proceed. We're monitoring their, um, the adverse event reports they might submit, monitoring it for any safety safety events that would uh, make us want to, you know, have them stop the trial. Um, and, and you know, as it proceeds to through phase through the different phases, we're giving them feedback along the way. All right, now move to this larger trial. Now move to this trial within the disease state. Um, and here, let we'll help you to design a trial that might that that um, we think will meet. The approval standard. We, in addition to those individual meetings that we have, um, we also issue um, a good number of guidances to to uh, to regulated industries. So that would be academic sponsors as well as industry to say, you know, this is how you meet. This is how you could meet this standard. This is what we would be looking for in this kind of trial. I don't believe we have one that's specific um, to myositis, but we have generally applicable trials. That uh, guidances that sponsors will look at. So that is how, um, and we have a number of guidances specifically focused on rare diseases, on remote monitoring, digital, you know, use of digital health technology, clinical trial diversity, um, you know, use of natural histories, um, uh, any number of topics that I think would be useful to sponsors in this space. And that's, I think, how we engage with with regulated industry or academics to um, to uh, move research forward. All along the way, also, we're keeping our ear our ear out. Um, I'm going to talk about our patient engagement, and but we're also listening to, to sponsors and trying to figure out where the sticking spots are and whether there's something that's within our authority to help them get uh, to get further along. For instance, you know, when we hear about manufacturing issues across a class of products, you know, we're going back and thinking, is there is there a policy we can put in place that would would help to to get past this. Is there, you know, could we could we set ARPA H on that to like solve this problem for us? Um, because they've got gazillions of dollars. <laughs> so let's put them on something useful. Um, that's that's sort of how how we are involved in research. And then so I'm going to continue to talk about um, about patient engagement as well. Sorry for that detour. Um, all right, next slide. So we've got, you know, as I said, CBER is a center within the FDA. We've got um, our, our sister medical product center, CEDAR and CDRH. In addition, there are, there are specific offices and staffs. Um, there's an office of patient affairs within the, the commissioner's office, a stakeholder engagement staff. And, you know, we work regularly across those because uh, I don't ever expect patients to actually know what center they're reaching out to, um, to keep track of that. Like that's the job of someone like me. <laughs> I want people to reach out to FDA and get a, a warm escort to the person that they need to speak speak to. And a lot of times patients wanna talk to all of the centers. They're, they're like, I, I'm sure many of you do not care whether it is a monoclonal antibody regulated by CEDAR or if it's a immune globulin regulated by, by CBER, you wanna know how these trials can advance and you want the agency to know what, um, sorry, um, what are are most important to to you all? So we regularly are meeting and and doing cross center collaboration um, and listening sessions, um, as well as guide still on that. So let me uh, move on to the next slide. Sorry, I just got distracted by the chat. Um, <laughs> so um, 
And this is just a summary of the various um, the various programs within the centers. And as you can see, it sort of operates in this this big hub. And and one um, one organization that, that I didn't mention is our Oncology Center of Excellence, OCE. Um, they are a cross-cutting organization uh, across all of the medical product centers, and they've got some really great um, patient outreach and and honestly, some like best practices that I'm trying to figure out how we implement within our center. Because um, they, they are very engaged with the community. It's, but um, it's a very, uh, I, I'm sure everyone knows someone who has had cancer, but it is very direct community as well. So I think um, it's not one where people are on diagnostic odysseys. Um, all right, next next slide. Great. So, so I mentioned this Regen Med Ed program that our Office of Therapeutic Products does in patient engagement and regenerative medicine. And I, I bring up regenerative medicine because I think it, it may be uh, it, it may be relevant. There are, uh, I think on, on one side of the spectrum, there are, are folks, bad actors, stem cell clinics that are saying that stem cells will cure everything and anything. Um, and like, as probably your mother told you, like, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. But there's a lot of exciting work happening in regenerative medicine and cellular therapies. So I think it's it's great that our that this our office has taken this taken this on to really provide education about what they're doing um, and how um, how patients and caregivers can be can be involved um, with regenerative medicine therapy. So that's cellular products, some gene therapies, um, tissue-based products, um, sort of that that area. So um, I just put some summary. Next slide too uh, shows some examples of some recent engagements, although it's like hard to read, I'm sure. But as you can see, we've got a workshop for patient advocates. We have a, a webinar on, on natural history studies. Um, you know, workshops on clinical trials and the patients patient um, patient experience, which I think is is so critical. Um, you know, I was I was at a a meeting a few weeks ago where we, we were talking about placebo controlled trials, and of course, like if I were a patient in a trial, I'd probably be disappointed if I got a placebo, just like as a like personal matter. And in like theory, I understand why we need placebos, but if it were me, I'd, I'd be disappointed. But, um, you know, we were talking with patients and sponsors and both centers and scientists and the, the patients were explaining, well, it's not just the placebo, it's that I'm getting muscle biopsies done um, and I'm traveling hundreds of miles to participate in a trial. And I think it's important for companies to hear that, that patient burden. It's important for FDA to hear it as well, because um, we want to make sure that we're getting the right, that we're getting the answer, we're getting the science that we need. But at the same time, we need to think about what tools we can use to make, to make it easier for patients to engage in clinical research, because th that is a, I, I feel like it's really um, a, a moral imperative of ours to, to recognize the the, the contribution that patients make by participating in clinical trials. Um, so, all right, uh, next. I wanna talk about patient-focused drug development, which has um, been been around for, I think about, I wanna think 15 years, um, something that, that Janet Woodcock, when she was um, center director in our in the Center for Drugs, she recently retired, but she really felt like it was important. I speak, spoke to some patient advocates that were involved in, in the creation of, of this. She really felt like it was important to humanize the drug review process and for reviewers to hear from patients to understand what, what their decisions meant, how, how it impacted, um, how it impacted the patients themselves. And and I think equally important for it. And one of the reasons I wanted to tell a little bit about myself, equally important for patients to understand that FDA is not a, a monolith. We are um, individual scientists, lawyers, physicians who are, are trying to make our, our best use of science and, and the best decision that we can for the public health. Um, and so I think the patient-focused drug development, I, I think is like a really exciting example. So instead of having sort of anecdotal patient experiences, you know, stories, this is really a way to make it more um, systematic and hopefully meaningfully incorporated into the drug development and evaluation process. So understanding, you know, disease burden, understanding what endpoints are most important to patients. Like what, if you take a drug, what are the most important things to you about what it does? Like maybe you don't care, you know, if you can do a certain function, but like 
he could walk up the stairs without getting out of breath that you would prefer to have that measured and have that that effect um so really looking at the beginning as as companies are designing these trials and figuring out like what really is important how do we design endpoints to measure whether or not a drug is is making a difference and what's most important um uh, right. Sorry. And patient-focused drug development. I know uh, and next month there is a uh, externally focused patient-focused drug development um, on, uh, on, am I going to say it right, dermatomyositis. And I know there was an FDA listening session in 2020 on, on IBM. Um, and so, you know, that's, those are really important um, to understand, you know, how, how the disease is affecting your day-to-day -day life. What are your most problematic symptoms? What are your perspectives on the current therapies that might be available? And what are your hopes and unmet medical needs? And, and also like what uncertainty will you accept? And those like those listening sessions really do make a difference. They provide review staff with important context for, for regulatory decision. There are reports that come out of it. And the impact might not be immediately evident, but it really does inform, it informs our advice to sponsors. We, it, it, um, and it informs our benefit risk assessment when we're looking at clinical trials and when we're ultimately looking at, at approval. So um, next, next slide. And I guess this is just, a, I should have had this up while I was talking about it, but um, at the beginning when I was saying, you know, I don't think, I, I hope the patients are involved the whole way through, whether they're in clinical trials or sort of as as stake the most important stakeholders, at the beginning identifying and measuring the outcomes and bur burdens. But I think and and also like at the end, if something's approved, making sure that we're getting follow up, making sure we're seeing how it how it operates in in um, practice. But um, also, you know, during the clinical study process, and we're going to integrate that those patient reported outcomes and patient preferences into benefit risk assessments. Um, Next slide. Right, and then this is just building on the patient-focused drug development um, 21st century cures that I worked on, um, as well as our, um, <laughs> I guess this is a lot of abbreviations, probably well in the weeds. Uh, we have commitments that we make every, every five years we negotiate uh, with with uh, industry and get um, user fees that help to fund our staff. So it's not like a, it's not a pay for play situation. We don't, they don't pay us to get approval, but they contribute to our staff so that we can more timely review products and put out um, scientific guidances to help move, move products forward. So here's a, a summary of, um, you know, how, how that's, that sort of worked out. It's, it's very methodical and in stages. And I think um, has a lot to show for it. Um, over the years. Next slide. Great. And here's just a, a some, I was talking about guidances that we put out, right? So this is like advice, sort of like formal advice um, and um, guidances that we put out the sponsors can follow so that they can make um, more, you know, move, like I said, move from anecdotes to like a systematic collection of patient data. Um, so, you know, clinical outcome assessments, um, how to, you know, I think that's a really important um, uh, scientific methodology. Um, and then, you know, methods to identify what's important to patients, like, so that we can do this in a way that that is uh, structured and can contribute to our benefit risk assessment. Next slide. Great. And so I said at the beginning, FDA does not fund clinical trial research um, with, with a limited exception. Um, FDA's Office of Orphan Product Development, um, which some of you, you may be familiar with, they sort of, uh, they work on orphan drug exclusivity um, and uh, they have this, this grants program. They're sort of this little, there are this little engine that could in the commissioner's office. Uh, and I worked there at one point, so I have a certain fondness for them. Um, but since since the founding of the office, they have given out orphan grants to clinical investigators to support the development of safe and effective medical products um, for patients with rare diseases. A few years ago, that was broadened to include natural history studies and biomarker studies. Um, they usually fund early stage clinical trials, um, but uh, as a last count, the clinical trials that they've sponsored, that they've given money towards, have facilitated the approval of more than 80 products. And I, I did look through, and there have been some myositis uh, trials actually that they've, um, that they've funded. Um, 
a few years ago, the um, Accelerating Access to Critical Therapies for ALS Act was an act, the Act for ALS Act, um, established a rare neurodegenerative disease grant program that they also administer. Um, and they've they've been funding that for about two years now. So though that's really the funding that comes out of FDA for clinical trials. Um, otherwise, uh, the agency really is in more of a collection and referee mode, but really wants to engage with, with patients um, along the way. Okay, Oof. Uh, I think, next slide. I think these might just be resources. Yes, great. So these are links to these workshops. Um, that, that we've had, um, as well as some patient engagement. Um, so I would like to, I think, um, I was sorry to, I'm sorry to get distracted. I'm trying to look at the chat and think about the questions that we received. That's okay, Perfect. Julie. I've been watching yeah. the chat for you. Yeah, um, right. There is one question you might want to address here while we're on this, back on this slide. And before we take the slide share down, so... Um, Martha has asked if forms of myositis qualify in the other neurodegenerative diseases portion of the Act for ALS Act. Yeah, you know, I was I was thinking about that. Um, <laughs> I have to say, when I was pulling up, uh, I am. I think it's possible. Um, it's not very much funding. It's five million dollars, I think. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, because uh, I was involved in negotiating negotiating that bill, and we, I, I, you know, ALS is a devastating disease. There's, there's no, um, there's no and, question about that. But um, whether or not this is considered, a, a, like, neurodegenerative or, 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 I, I, anyways, <laughs> I, yeah. And Paul and Julie, I'm, I'm just gonna chime in because Please. about a year and a half ago, uh, when this was all happening. I set up a call with uh, Paul Melmeyer and, and Dr. Lloyd and Tom Lloyd. And at that point, the same question was raised. Um, and Tom, Dr. Lloyd, and Paul were, were the two of them that were going through that. And, and it was a question that um, I think today still remained unanswered. But um, I can FYI follow up if, if you guys would like with Paul uh, to see where that ended up. And Paul, just FYI, is uh, with the Muscular Dystrophy Association. And um, I know an associate that has worked with Julie numerous times over the past several years. Yeah. I mean, some so examples, yeah, I think that would be great. Uh, some examples, of course, ALS, you know, uh, you know, some of the ataxias, mucopolysaccharidosis, I'm always happy when I can, or our demon pick type C. I, I mean, that that grant program also is doing some interesting things that I think translate um, across many conditions. Um, some of the uh, funding, some of the, some studies in like brain computer interface um, work that, um, that hopefully also will benefit more than just one disease. Well, Julie, yeah. I wasn't expecting you to get um, quite that advanced on the technology. That's going to take a minute for my brain to process <laughs> the fact that you just said brain computer interface. And earlier you mentioned ARPA and ARPA H. So just in case we have some folks on the line who aren't familiar, self included, um, could you describe ARPA H? I will try. Um, <laughs> ARPA H is a separate uh, research and funding organization within within the Health and Human Services Department of Health and Human Services, and it was, um, I think, it was established maybe two or three years ago, and sort of based on the um, uh, DARPA, which I guess I think DARPA founded the internet. I don't know, um, but this like move fast and break things, right? And so like they have a lot of money. Um, and they're, they're, that is like literally their motto. They're, they're really taking on some very, very big issues and trying all sorts of different solutions. Um, you know, we're working with them on some, some manufacturing questions that they have in the cellular space. Um, you know, in the rare disease space, they actually, um, they just funded this project on, um, artificial intelligence driven, um, analysis of, um, of approved of approved products to see whether or not they could act, could be used in rare diseases. So like 
what we call repurposing. So you've got an approved product that you know might have any number of, of uses. And I, I don't know what they're doing because like my intelligence is not, I'm not very intelligent about artificial, artificial intelligence. intelligence. But, <laughs> but the artificial intelligence is going to figure out all of these drugs that are already developed, if they can be, you know, if there's a possibility that can be used for, for other diseases, which like is, is pretty cool. Um, so that I know they announced that on rare disease day, but um, they're not, I think they're not, ARPA-H isn't doing funding on like very specific diseases, but really like big health infrastructure um, projects. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, thank you. That's very interesting. It almost relates to a question that Rhonda asked in the chat about if there is a path for compassionate use of drugs for different forms of myositis that may not be FDA approved. So going a little bit beyond off label, but could you share? Yeah, I think I'd be happy to. And and thank you, because I really should have included that in my in my slides, because that's that's a really important program that that FDA has. Um, so compassionate use is um, when you know you you access an unapproved product outside of a clinical trial um, with the assistance of your your physician or healthcare provider, um, and um, and and sometimes compassionate use is used for off label uses too, although it's a little bit murky. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know you can work with your work with your healthcare provider. But there are resources on on FDA's website, and I'm happy to to follow up afterwards that sort of walk you through the process. And in fact, there's a there's it, it, it's called an expanded access. It, well, we, compassionate use, but we call it expanded access. Um, there's actually a, an app that you can go through that your physician can go through that directs it to the right place. Um, one of the things that we balance when FDA very, very rarely turns down expanded access requests. But I think some of the challenges that patients have is their physician not being familiar with it. Um, mm. Their physician maybe not having access to a, it has to have an investigational review board review. Um, and sometimes companies do not have the most robust expanded access programs, um, you know, for, for any number of reasons. And, you know, they can, they could decide that they just, they don't have enough product that they produce that they can, they can, you know, give it outside of a clinical trial because ultimately the biggest benefit for the most patients is when you go through a clinical trial and you get approved, right? But um, so it's really incumbent on the, the company to decide that they want to do it. Um, but there are resources for physicians who are interested in, and, and healthcare providers who are interested in, in getting expanded access for their, for their patients. And uh, as I said, I'll follow up. Um, with That's great. The, Thank you. We'll be happy to share those links too. Certainly mm -hmm. decision and clinician awareness of myositis is of a really important priority for TMA and a pressing need for everyone on the line tonight. But we are so fortunate in myositis to have a number of very well-informed, very energetic docs. <laughs> Some of so, which are on the line tonight. There, I'm, I'm gonna say thank you, Dr. Lisa Christopher Stein for joining us yes. from Johns Hopkins. Thrilled to have you. Um, yes. Yes. Julie, if you don't mind answering just one more question from the chat, um, Ricky was wondering if you could explain why do biosimilars matter? And in the grand scheme of CBERS scope mm -hmm. and, and the biologics versus biosimilars, um, please share with yeah. us. Yeah, I think um, I think last month we celebrated approval of our, our 50th biosimilar. Um, it's a, you know, a relatively new program. It was established with the Affordable Care Act and in, in 2011. And, you know, biosimilars are this me too versions of, of innovator, innovator products. Uh, biologics are, are hard to, to manufacture. They're complicated to manufacture. You want to make sure that you're testing, um, you know, their, their quality and um, biosimilars are, are a way that presumably you have like a much more expedited path to approval. They basically show that they function the same way the, the innovator product does. So they're somewhat like um, like the generic drugs, right? The non-branded drugs that you might get. Um, probably anyone who takes a statin does not take the name brand um, Lipitor anymore, right? You get the, I don't know, Torvastatin. Is that the right? I don't know if that's the right name. Um, biosimilars are similar to that. And we actually are moving, I think, towards policies that would um, make clear uh, that they're that they're interchangeable, so that that physicians can sort of move from the branded, the innovator branded to to the biosimilar, um, and know that they've gone through careful FDA analysis. Um, I, I would say that that probably is most relevant for like rituximab and other monoclonal antibodies, which 
for like very strange historical reasons are regulated by the Center for Drugs. Um, <laughs> but it's probably the more complicated, the more complicated products that are that are in our center are probably not going to end up being biosimilars because um, the the key, the foundational assessment for biosimilars is that they, you show that they're uh, analytically and structurally the same. And for some of these very complicated cellular and, and gene therapies, in order to like go through all of that to show that they're safe, you might as well do your own clinical trials. Um, so I think that eventually what we're gonna see though in the innovator space, so you've got biosimilars for like, you know, rituximab and other products and that presumably you get, the first one drops the price usually. And then after three, it drops the price even more um, is is traditionally my understanding of the, the economics there. I think for, for sort of the quote innovative products, what what happens is, um, especially if you keep your standards up, innovation it drives innovation, and you've got folks that are sort of like competing with each other to make a better product, and presumably a less expensive product because they figured out how to make it easier. They figured out a streamlined manufacturing. So, so I think biosimilars are an incredible cost saver to the country, and and really important. And um, you know, as much as we can streamline. Um, while allowing innovation to happen and, and meeting our standards, I think that that is that I think that's good for patients, um, and ultimately will we'll bring down the the prices. And hopefully, you all don't have to deal with the very high prices for gene therapies. Um, all right. Let me just just ask a little quick one from some of the questions. Julie, can you talk about the time frame within a drug trial? Um, yeah. How can we shorten it? Where are we today? Does it differ from one agent, one division to another? Um, knowing that there are some some drug trials on the horizon with the various types of myositis. Um, so I think that what I think is the figure I've read is is about ten years on average from from discovery to to approval, which is is a long time. Um, and FDA is doing what we can to shorten our review process, but that's really months in this year long. Um, Saga. And so I think when we're looking and giving clinical advice to folks, at, at least in my center and, and, in, and in CEDAR as well, we're really trying to think about how, how it can be most efficiently accomplished. And I think there are differences in, I think when you're dealing, dealing with serious diseases with unmet need, um, sometimes there, there is an urgency that can help move things, move trials along more and you might not... Um, it's expect them to go as long, you know, for, for, you know, your standard vaccines right now, those are like 45,000 people studies. It takes many, many years to do them, right? Not the COVID vaccine, but like, um, although those were like 45,000 people studies. So, so that's like the, the sort of the slowest, right? And of course you want to be really careful when you're giving products to healthy children um, to prevent diseases. I think when you start talking about serious unmet needs, we're, we're not thinking about just you know how we can get our review timeline down because there's only so much you can you can do once you have um once you have a file in-house but really like how early and often can we give advice to sponsors to speed along their development resolve their manufacturing issues resolve their clinical trial issues and some of these rare disease uh clinical trials are you know less than 100 people total in trials, which obviously is a much shorter development time frame. It's not, not every trial is not gonna be that way, but um, you know, I think we're really, when we're, we're looking at what we're imposing, it's gonna be how big the patient population is um, and thinking about the urgency of getting treatments along um, and, and what, can, what can we, what will meet our standard? Like I'm, I am, I firmly, firmly believe patients with rare diseases deserve safe and effective products. But we also know that patients with unmet needs are willing to accept some uncertainty. Um, and, you know, I, I wanna have, I, I think we all here have some urgency in, in getting, getting clinical trials done as quickly as they can and getting our reviews done as quickly as we can. We have a, a pilot that we just started um, and we, we're just launching it actually in the next couple of weeks. Um, and it's a pilot, so it's only a couple a couple of sponsors. We're basically we're looking at sponsors that are in their clinical tr clinical uh, trial phase and trying to take the lessons learned from the pandemic 
where we did a lot of like pick up the phone when you have a question and do that sort of informal back and forth, which we just don't have as much um, for most development programs. So it's like our operational warp speed approach because it was it was really successful. Um, and uh, we call it a start pilot. So we picked three or four products, I think, in each center that we're just going to give that iterative advice and just keep talking to sponsors. And we've got to figure out how we can sustain that. But I think that's that's really helpful. Um, and we've got a good number of expedited programs, we call them, that we designate promising treatments. And those folks get extra meetings. And, and those do shorten times. Um, we've done studies like they by years, um, you know, breakthrough designation or um, regenerative medicine advanced therapy designation it, because they get the sort of it's promising to start with and then they get the extra meetings and it really does move it along the pipeline quickly. Um, is that yeah, yeah. So yeah, we were, I guess we were lucky during COVID and I know that you worked on that particular little, uh, little problem. But with we as patients, you know, here we are as patients with, with a rare disease that doesn't have a that doesn't have a cure. Um, you know, we go through the NIH and, and I'm I'm going, I know there are a lot of providers on here. And then then you have this fund of money and say, okay, guys, you know, the pharmaceutical company A, B, and C are coming to you and you're determining you're determining what drugs and what trials we can fund. It it almost seems like a parallel line. Can we how do we know what what drug companies are taking to the FDA? How do we get a head start before stuff gets to you? Um, I guess I've always been a firm believer in, and um, working with, with some government <laughs> contracts in my former life, when you see an RFP or you see an RFQ, frequently a lot of those things are somewhat already a done deal or people have a head start. So how do we know what's happening? Do we go to the pharmaceutical companies and say, hey, go to the FDA, they may have, right? do you do an RFP out? Do we go to the, the drug companies? Where is some of the novice individuals? Well, I and I think there's power in numbers. So, you know, I know like, um, like, you know, like Muscular Dystrophy Association, right, as an umbrella organization. Right. And and I saw when I when I was on the Hill, I felt like some of those coalitions are not necessarily under an umbrella organization. But, you know, when when I, you know, when I received a letter from 20 patient groups that on a on an issue that sort of gave, you know, um, gave it a louder voice. I mean, I met with plenty of, of individual patient groups as well. And um, and patients, and and that was really important, and and shaped sort of my, gave me context for for what I was doing. I think that I think it is important to hold, um, to hold companies accountable, um, and and when I say that, you know, engaging with them early on um, as they're as they're designing their trials, and also like not if they're designing things that are really burdensome for patients, I think engaging with them and letting them know that, um, as well as, you know, I've seen patients like throw what we call like crappy data. It's a technical term, but at FDA and then say like, but you're disappointing all these patients, but like, no, you're disappointing all these patients because you're taking advantage of their hope. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, you, you all are the ones who, are gonna have to participate in the trials, right? Or your loved ones are gonna participate in the trials. You have the biggest stake in these products. And I think that it's engaging with the companies is is really important. And, and for some of the rare diseases, I guess, you know, I've seen I've seen a lot of um I've seen a lot of now sort of this shift. It used to be patient groups were funded by industry, right? So there was sort of this like a little bit of skepticism, like, oh, are you just, a, you know, a, you know, are you just going to a meeting on behalf of industry to tell us you'll accept, you know, uncertainty because, you know, the company's got uh, crappy data and and they want it approved. And now I feel like patients are raising money and funding research and funding basic research, not just like a particular molecule, but funding a a clinical outcome assessment tool or funding research onto a, onto a biomarker. I mean, it just depends on the means that people have, but 
you know, I've seen very, very rare disease groups do this. Um, and I think, um, Nancy, one of the questions that came in ahead of time was, what is the most effective and efficient uh, advocacy that I've seen? Um, and I, and I think, I think two things. Um, when I was when I was on the hill, I met with patients. Some of their stories uh, have have stayed with me, um, and really influenced the way I make policy and I make decisions. I'm just hearing, and and honestly, it's some of the women that I met with when I was on the hill who told me about their experience with some implanted devices and the their their saga trying to get them removed right the pain that they suffered um and i that really resonated with me and I'm like to this day um that was incredibly effective um when when folks go to the when you when when patient groups go to the hill i think personal stories are incredibly effective but also um to me the most effective is is to be asking big picture issues so not going and demanding demanding approval by congress of a particular drug because congress is going to say well FDA is the expert, hopefully, FDA is the expert. They need to make the scientific judgment, right? And so then you're sort of putting yourself in a, in a weird spot. Um, it's better to, to be like, well, I would like funding in this disease or, you know, get behind an initiative that is broader than a particular disease, a particular drug or a particular program, um, you know, regulatory science, biomarkers, clinical outcome assessments, something that sort of raises all ships. Um, and then, in my time actually back in in CBER, I have seen a good number of patient groups that have engaged with scientists, academics, and companies, and put and and put together these meetings that are really I feel like educational for all of us. And FDA comes to it, so we talk about regulatory aspects of it. We talk about the science. We talk about you know burden of burden of disease, burden of clinical trials. Um, those, those to me, the, the past couple of months, I've been to a few of them have been, um, there's a workshop on heparin sulfate, which is, you know, a, a storage, you know, a biomarker potentially used for some of the storage diseases. Um, I went to a meeting on limb girdle muscular dystrophy um, in Bethesda a month or two ago, um, bringing all of those parties together, not necessarily for an outcome around a particular product, but really to, so everyone can understand the state of the science, the state of the regulation and the state of where, where, you know, how that matters to patients. I, I think that's sort of the next next stage for me of uh, how how patients can be engaged and, and move from progress so, work. Yeah, I mean, these are all incredible, incredible things. And, you know, as we're pulling them together, um, I have another question for someone who, Julie, at some point in your, your career, I hope you have the opportunity to meet. And who is who were were actually excited to have on tonight? Uh, uh, Dr. Lisa Christopher Sign, who actually runs the Myositis Center at uh, Johns Hopkins, and she's asked she'd like to also understand when the FDA pursues breakthrough status for a drug for rare diseases like IBM. Great. That is a that is a great question. Um, a little in the weeds, but everyone I'm like FDA. I'm an FDA nerd, so I'm very excited about that. Um, <laughs> I was at the agency when Breakthrough um, was first uh, established by Congress and and helped to implement it. So, um, so that is so that that is one of our expedited programs, as I said, and it's a, it's a designation that promising products get, and it entitles them to to earlier and more frequent meetings, to higher level management engagement, to help to help hopefully advance their program. So there's um, uh, sort of like the original fast track designation, which has a, a slightly lower bar. Um, breakthrough, we've got to have some promising clinical data um, before you get the designation. And then the newest one is regenerative medicine advanced therapy, which is supposed to be somewhere in the middle um, because you might not have clinical data with, with cellular products in quite the same way as you might with, with small molecules, but all of them are intended to um, give folks more access to the agency to help expedite expedite the development of the program. And so uh, companies have to apply to that. Um, we've got a guidance that sort of spells out all the criteria uh, for it. I'm just, uh, um, let's put it in the chat. Um, but the companies actually apply for it and they, they like to have it because they can go back to their investors and say, we got breakthrough designation. Um, that, it just means they're getting more meetings um, and hopefully moving along 
more quickly. And then that should help also with the review because at that point, FDA will be more familiar with their, their technology, with their, with their program. And one of the challenges actually we see with breakthrough products and, and regenerative medicine advanced therapy products is that their clinical data is, is compelling enough for it to be promising and they can't catch up with their manufacturing um, mm -hmm. because they're, they're getting such expert. I mean, we should all be so lucky, I guess, but it is actually a, a something that holds back. So we've got some like clinical uh, or, or we've got some manufacturing readiness pilots that we're working on to try to make sure that we're that part of the, the development is keeping track as well. Um, so we have kind of a quick kind of a, a calendar question. Um, you talked about the budget that you have within the FDA um, and that, that you're able to fund different programs as the, these companies come to you and then you get and, and you get X number of dollars from Congress for this. So yeah, we have a parallel track in so far as looking at what what you're doing, but also trying to get more funds out of Congress to to put them towards rare disease and and working drugs. Would you say that your calendar in pursuing um, new endeavors, whether it's it's a drug trial, whether it's a genomic? Uh, whether it's something with with AI is similar in in funding to the legislative calendar. I I just was I was trying to think about this um, in terms of the I... orphan the orphan grants programs. Um, yes, those are yes. usually on the the fiscal year calendar. Um, okay, and you know we I think so orphan grants I think usually get their. Um, I want to think they get appropriated every five years, at least. Um, they're they're authorized to get a certain amount of money. They usually get half of that, but it's usually a chunk of you know, a chunk of money for a bit. Um, you know, obviously we're in like this age of budget uncertainty constantly. It's very challenging at a government, a large government agency, um, to be staring down a shutdown all the time. I can say that with because I've managed managed those that we've narrowly avoided. Um, it's a lot of work. Um, it's also very challenging for your fiscal year to start halfway through because then you've got money that suddenly you're like, oh my gosh, we've got to spend it. And you don't, it, the government does not have the means to move quickly on anything. So it really, the, the wheels get, get bogged down. But I, I know for the orphan grants program and, and the rare neurodegenerative disease program, though, they, they've got it down to a, they've got it down pat and they're, so they go on the fiscal year calendar that's similar to, uh, and they put out an RF. RFA, um, you know, I, I think they've got a listserv um, with information about that. And usually those those trials are going for those that money is usually going towards early stage trials and like academic investigators. They're not like they're not they, they've got such a small pot of money. They're not generally giving it to like companies. Right. Like companies can raise raise venture. Right. They can rent, raise, raise venture capital. Um, but there's some small startups that might get get the money, but really it's going towards um towards academic investigators, I think. Okay. Um I'm I'm there. Paula, do you have any more in in your in chat that have come in? No, or... Nancy. I think um we could take the opportunity to take a picture with Julie if she Oh, oh so I'm yes. Paula, why don't you talk about this? 